Well, hello there. Fancy meeting you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to appear on Meet the Archaeologist. Uh, could you possibly introduce yourself and your role here in the Newcastle Archaeology Department? Yeah, certainly Mark. Uh, good afternoon. My name is James Gerrard. I'm a lecturer in Roman Archaeology and I also uh, I deal with the undergraduate admissions, so technically I'm tutor for undergraduate admissions, that's my title, and I'm also degree programme director, so I'm in charge of the undergraduate taught degrees. Right, okay. That sounds like quite a, quite a plateful. Um, uh, is it, is it, uh, do you get any time for actual archaeology in there as well? Or? Yeah, I, I, dig, I dig every summer and uh, I do my research on top of the teaching and, and the other elements to my job. Mm -hmm. um, and actually having, having variety in your role is, is what makes life bearable, I think. Well, that's true, that's true, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, now, looking at your, uh, at your interests, and indeed, as we were just talking before we started filming, um, it sounds like, like you, uh, you, you've done various things leading up to your role, for example, here at Newcastle. Uh, are there any particular excavations that stand out in your mind? Yeah, um, in, in some ways it's easier to talk about the excavations that don't stand out <laughs> in my mind. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've been on quite a few big projects. I worked I worked commercially in London in contract archaeology. Uh, so I worked on a big site called Draper's Gardens, mm -hmm. which was in the Walbrook Valley, with a lot of waterlogged Roman archaeology. We had a nice hoard of copper alloy vessels down a well. And that was that was really impressive actually. Um, but I've also dug in Orkney, so I worked on some Viking archaeology up there and again the, the kind of the kind of preservation and the type of archaeology there is, is second to none and that's a really beautiful place to work and um, you know more recently and, and certainly when I was growing up I was working in in Somerset mm -hmm. so, and, and I worked worked on some pretty interesting sites down there mm -hmm. sometimes quite small um, but on one of those we found a Bronze Age shield Wow <laughs> so um, it's I, I guess that's one of the exciting things about archaeology. You never you, you dig a hole or you do some survey work. You never know what you're going to find, and it mm. is that it is that excitement, that discovery that that drives many of us. I think. Mm. So the archaeology is like a box of chocolates. Um, yeah, you just get <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you just you just pray that it's not the strawberry cream every time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you know, not I suppose not every hole is exciting, but no. but most trenches are. You know, have their own Excellent. bits of interest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so you found yourself here at the Newcastle Department, where actually the, there's an excellent classics cohort as well. You have the archaeology and the classics re really working closely together. Um, this seems to be the right part of the world if you're interested in Romans. Uh, would you say that, that that your interest is is focused on Romans, or, or do you have a, a broader um, sort of scope of, of interest at the moment? Um, I would I would define myself as a Romanist, but I'm I'm a particular flavour I suppose of Romanist. So I'm particularly interested in the end of the Roman period mm -hmm. and the early Middle Ages. So I'm interested in the fall of the Roman Empire, um, and I'm particularly interested in the south of Britain. So what happens in those regions that don't become Anglo-Saxon for two or three hundred years? Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of Dark Age mm -hmm. stuff down in the West Country, that's one of my main research interests. Okay, um, so with that in mind, I believe you've, you've recently written a book, um, uh -huh. would you like to possibly show us <laughs> <I can't>. what that is? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Wonderful. The, the Ruin of Roman the Britain. The Ruin of Roman Britain. Okay, Which excellent. Is, uh, you, you, were say, you were saying though it's hideously expensive. <laughs> it is, um, <laughs> available from all good bookshops for uh, a recommended retail price of £65, wow. okay. um, which is a, a bit steep. Um, Fair enough. Are they, Christmas is coming, who knows? You know? it, it is, <laughs> and uh, I think it is a bit cheaper than that on Amazon, Excellent. but uh, other bookshops are available. Okay. Well, of course, of course. <laughs> now, you just used the term Dark Ages there. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm certainly well aware, I mean, since I left, since I graduated, I've become more and more interested in that part, that period of history. I'm certainly aware that, that the Dark Ages is a bit of a, a loaded term, even a naughty term. Um, are you comfortable using that terminology? Um, 
I think I think Dark Ages is is certainly a very loaded term, mm. and it, it is in in some cases I, I think frowned on as a as a bit of a you know, the wrong kind of terminology to use. But it's it's very difficult to think about that period from I would say from about three hundred through to about I don't know seven hundred. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very difficult to come up with a term that isn't loaded. You know, what is it? Is it sub Roman? post-Roman, early medieval, pagan Saxon, mm. early Christian, depends Depends mm. where you are. It's all going to be qualitative in that sense, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so I, th- mm. you know, ad- actually I don't, in many ways I don't like the period labels, I don't, I don't like late Roman, dark age, I, I prefer to think about, if you like, those post-Roman centuries, the 5th, the 6th, and perhaps the 7th centuries, I prefer to think about them as a, as a kind of long sweep from about AD 250 or 300 through to you know AD 6 or AD 700 mm-hmm. um, and try to cut across those classic boundaries between Roman and Anglo-Saxon I don't think they actually help us to understand the period very well no okay but I'll say something I, I definitely believe passionately actually is, is helping people to move beyond that sort of succession of cartoon characters I suppose in, in, in the past um, but uh, and also I suppose yeah, the quality of elements. I mean, I always had a big problem with terms like the lower Paleolithic and upper Paleolithic. It, yeah, it, it's very qualitative. But as you say, I suppose you're calling something something. It's hard to it's hard to not be biased in that sense, isn't it? It is. And I, I suppose lower lower Paleolithic and upper Paleolithic, at least at one level, once upon a time reflected the stratigraphy that mm. people had mm. you know whereas um, certainly in French we talk about the high and the low empire and the low empire is the late empire which is somehow seen I think still seen as not quite as good a as the ex- less golden a little yeah. less golden <laughs> in the age of Augustus and Hadrian and yeah. all of all of those emperors mm. um, we we tend to think of and I think it, I think also that that image of the Roman Empire the image of the the image of Hadrian and Augustus and the marching legions wearing their red uniforms you know i think all of that that kind of early roman classical past mm, mm. is still the popular perception and mm. i think that's a shame because the late roman period um is very different mm, mm. in all kinds of ways mm. it's, it's very different i have to say when um uh do you remember the tv series rome yeah, HBO series, yeah, yeah. Um, which actually I, I quite like actually both me and um, mrs soup we both enjoy that series um, but uh, what we found interesting was the way that it was actually portraying Rome at the time. And one of the big criticisms that it got from, for example, TV critics was that, where's the marble, where's the Colosseum, where's the... And it, it is that idea that somehow Rome is, is, in many people's minds, it's squished, it's condensed down to this sort of, um, I don't know, this, this epic meta-Rome, I suppose, where the, whereas what they were portraying was fairly accurate it was it was it was the sort of the transition into, yeah. into the imperial Rome. no I, I mean I, I agree I, I I think the Roman Empire is in many people's view an unchanging thing mm. it is mm. the empire of the empire of Caesar mm. the is eternal city the eternal city mm. yeah you know it, it's the same right the way through and, and I think I think for a lot of for a lot of our undergraduates, actually, and a lot of our students who study the Roman period, realizing that the fourth century is different to the first century and that the second century is different to the third century, I think that's actually quite a big step for many of them because mm-hmm. they've been brought up, they've been fed, they've been fed a diet of mm. the Colosseum and Augustan imagery in in the popular media. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and yet we're very definitely different from the 1600s, aren't we? So, we are. <laughs> yeah. and that, I, I think that, that, is, that is an important, that is an important mm. way of thinking about things. Mm. You know, in, in the 4th century, we're, we're as separated from the 1st century as we are from the Elizabethans. Mm. Mm. Absolutely, definitely. Um, OK, well, we, we've talked a little bit about... Uh, so, well, quite interesting, actually, some, some interesting ideas there, about, especially about Romans. Um, but um, more broadly now, I suppose, as an archaeologist, what for you is the most satisfying element of being an archaeologist? The best way of answering this question is to really say that it, I'm phenomenally lucky because the most satisfying about being an archaeologist is being an archaeologist is what I want to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
and thus doing it for a job is is in many ways an immense privilege mm. and i can spend i can spend my working life doing things that many people can only do in their spare time as a hobby mm -hmm. and um i th i think that is an immense it is an immense privilege and it is it is very satisfying and all all jobs have their ups and their downs but particularly in the in the bleaker moments that we all have in our working lives i think saying to myself that actually this is what i want to be doing mm. i'm i'm not you know i'm not sat in a big concrete office block somewhere pressing a button mm -hmm. um I, th I think that is that's, that is the most satisfying thing about it and mm. I, you know there are stories to be told of the past the storytelling element appeals to me as well mm. I think. Mm. Yeah, absolutely yeah uh, uh, it's certainly one of the things i find very satisfying is um, when that moment when you realise that actually we're constantly creating and recreating the past in that sense. We're, you know, we're constantly re reinterpreting the past. Every new generation, for example, uh, of Roman academics, has something new to say about what for many people is a very fixed point in time. I mean, do you find that, that interesting as well? I do. I, I find, you know, the, the idea of archaeological interpretation, mm. you know, th th there isn't we're not really progressing to a final result the story changes and it changes as we get more data and it changes as we think more about our interpretations and actually you can look you can look back over the history of any academic discipline and you can see how the ideas that were in vogue 10 years ago were reflective of contemporary society's concerns and mm -hmm. And uh, I, th I think somebody once said that every generation gets the Stonehenge it deserves. <laughs> and it, you could say that for any period yeah. of the past. Actually, mm. you know, we get the we get the Roman Empire. Mm. We deserve. Mm. Um, mm. Absolutely, definitely. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that's a yeah a brilliant way of looking at it. Um, okay, uh, so what what challenges then do you think are facing archaeology and archaeologists? in the coming years? What, what do you think is on the horizon? I think archaeology always has something of a struggle to convince people of its relevance. Mm. And I think that's a real shame because I think archaeology is fundamentally about who we are, where we've come from. Mm -hmm. And obviously um, we've had a tough few years economically mm -hmm. and it's it's difficult to convince people to spend money on the past when there are lots of other things that that money could be spent on mm -hmm. and there you know there are many other calls on people's um, resources well we're set opposite a hospital aren't we, we are set know, opposite so a hospital which highlights that yeah highlights that, that balance um so so you think so in some ways convincing people of, of the, the 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 need for archaeology yeah i mm. i think so i th i think we would we would be intellectually and emotionally poorer as a nation without it i don't i don't think there's any there's necessarily any danger of it disappearing but i certainly think there's a danger that it may a trophy it may mm. it may become smaller mm. um and i i think we have to be very careful with the commercial archaeological sector that the the regulations which are often you know planning regulations are often seen as bad things because they're hindering economic development but that those regulations aren't watered down to the point that archaeology doesn't happen, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think from an academic perspective, there are challenging confront challenges confronting the uh, incoming students and, and often given the new fees regime, they're, they're worried or they're put under pressure from their parents to think about degrees that somehow are seen as economically more viable or mm -hmm. archaeology is, as a degree is sometimes perceived as an indulgence and it's actually it's as a broad humanities based degree it, mm -hmm. it offers a lot more than many other similar courses mm -hmm. you know no nobody um, would nobody would say history is an indulgence as a degree or few people would say that history is an indulgence as a degree mm -hmm. um, and archaeology brings quite a lot more to the table, I think. Absolutely, I, well, I firmly believe it's one of the subjects which touches um, some of the uh, the most other subjects of any subject that's out yeah. there in that sense. That's a very bad way of putting it. But for example, I've interviewed archaeologists in the past who, who 
their students have gone on to be people who man CT scanners or who, you know, who, who, or who are working, for example, in law or in medicine. Or in, so archaeology can be a wonderful grounding in that sense. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And it is, it does allow you to touch on a bit of everything. Mm. You know, you can be, you can do a bit of chemistry, mm. you can do a bit of physics, you can do a bit of biology, you can think about art, you know, you can do illustration, you can do hard science, all of those elements, storytelling, philosophy, all of those things are, are built in to archaeology. Um, and then there's all the, you know, all the kind of practical stuff. You've got to process data, you've got to interpret the data, you've got to collect it, you've got to work together in the field mm -hmm. to extract that data. Um, so, uh, you know, I think archaeology teaches, as a degree, teaches not just the academic skills, but quite a lot of useful life skills. How do you manage a project? How do you work together in difficult circumstances that, mm. that some other degrees maybe don't do so well? Mm. Uh, and also, I suppose, uh, a key, well, I think a really important skill for life is understanding that people live in different ways to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and they will have different, different attitudes, and, and it's a great way of learning to meet people. Um, by meeting dead people. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> no, I, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, that's exactly that's exactly true. Mm. You know, we, we live in a we live in a globalized world where there are many different cultures and countercultures, and understanding actually that, that difference is part of mm. all of us mm. and has always been that way mm. um, is is an important thing, I think, for humanity to to recognise. Mm. Okay. Um, so th throughout this our conversation, you seem to be very interested in um, the fact that archaeologists find what's new about the past, as it were, um, and uh, and looking forward to new archaeologists. Um, what advice would you give to anyone who's looking to get into archaeology? Um, people either who want to become students or who or who just want to potentially just dip their toe on a on a dig somewhere. Um, do you have any any tips? I think. I think there are two, really those two constituencies have have different have different needs. Mm -hmm. If you if you want to become a student, I'd recommend you you read about archaeology, you watch things on TV about archaeology. Mm -hmm. If you can, get involved with some field work, um, and I think really immerse yourself in in what it is as a subject because. If, if you're 17 or 18, you're thinking about going to university, you know, you probably won't have studied archaeology before, so get a good idea. And don't, don't listen, you know, don't always listen to the people who tell you no. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, uh, I was told when I was 16 that if I became an archaeologist, I'd starve. Mm. And I, I mean, I almost quote what one of my teachers told me. Mm. Um, and that's, that's not the case uh, you know there are jobs out there it is a it is a career mm -hmm. um, and even if you don't go into archaeology you can use that qualification for other things mm -hmm. if you're if you're um, looking at archaeology as an interest or a hobby then again there are there are loads of ways you can get involved there are quite a lot of um, distance learning courses you might be interested in doing there are um, Archaeological projects you can volunteer on. Some of those charge, some of them don't. Mm -hmm. um, there are archaeological societies, and those archaeological societies are in many ways the backbone of what we do. They're they're, they're the grassroots of archaeology in Britain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so join and support that organisation, mm. um, and. Explore the past. Mm. You know, it, it's it's everywhere. It's on your doorstep. Mm. It's in your library. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can get the maps of your town. You can do that research yourself. You can get maps of your town and see how your town changes through time. Mm. You know, there are historic sites all around. Mm -hmm. um, and don't be afraid to try. Mm -hmm. That's that's an important thing as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, good advice. Definitely. Um, Right, well, I suppose bring, to bring all the proceedings to a close, um, I suppose finally I'd, I'd love to know, do you have any um, any upcoming research, any exciting plans in the near future? Uh, what's happening with James Gerald? <laughs> um, I hope that I'll be 
digging next summer um, a little deserted medieval settlement mm -hmm. in Somerset. And this is part of a project I've been working on for a couple of years now at a place called Lufton. And um, I've been doing some digging there the last two years, and that's mainly been in the landscape around a late Roman villa. And I'm looking at this deserted medieval settlement next year because I really hope that we might get that medieval settlement a bit earlier than we think it should go. So I, I know there's some 10th century pottery from that site, but it would be really quite important if we found some 9th or 8th century material culture, or even, although this is very unlikely, um, even some 5th or 6th century material culture, 5th or 6th century artefacts. Um, so I'm, I'm quite excited about trying to trying to bring that research together so that we join the villa, the Roman villa and the medieval archaeology up mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. sort of coherent way rather than looking at them as individual sites. Um, other things I'm, I'm working on, uh, I'm, I'm currently writing a paper, um, have been for some time, uh, on radiocarbon dating late Roman cemeteries and I do, I do wonder how many late Roman cemeteries go on into the 5th or 6th centuries and how we can demonstrate that and maybe radiocarbon is is one way mm -hmm. hasn't hasn't been done a lot actually mm -hmm. surprisingly you know it's an old technique now mm -hmm. it's been around a long time but particularly on the late roman period it hasn't been hasn't been deployed in the way it could have been mm. and you think that this this goes back to that concept that somehow the late roman period is is less worthy uh, a field to study on and that transition yeah i i guess it does mm. in some ways i i think also there's a there's a sense that we we know what the late Roman period is, mm -hmm. so we know what the burials look like. So we don't think that they look that they that they date they to another period yeah. that they look mm -hmm. any different, if you like. So I think yeah, I think there is an there is an issue there, mm -hmm. um, but clearly clearly in the west of Britain at least. Mm -hmm the Roman style of burial does seem to continue into the 5th and 6th centuries, whereas in the East you get the so-called Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. style, mm -hmm. uh, where people are buried with weapons and pots and all the rest of it. Um, so I do wonder if some of our Roman cemeteries go a bit later than we've perhaps mm -hmm. considered. Mm. Okay. Well, um, that sounds like very interesting uh, research. Uh, well, hopefully people keep an eye out for, uh, for what you're up to. Uh, well, thanks again for, uh, for taking the time to have a chat, and uh, until next time, bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>